Welcome everyone to another kind of open. My name is Fiona Salisbury and I'm a member of the board of the <clears throat> Council of Australian University Librarians and the Program Director for the Enabling and Modern Curriculum Program. <clears throat> Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia, including the traditional owners of the unceded lands on which I live and work, the Wurundjeri people. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging for all First Nations peoples, wherever they are located. I also acknowledge our Indigenous colleagues, colleagues who are joining us today from across Australia and New Zealand. I'd like to invite you to acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands on which you live and work in the chat. So before we start, I've got a few housekeeping announcements. We will be recording this session and making it available after the event. And due to the large number of attendees we have today, you won't be able to use your microphone during the event. So please use the chat as a back channel to discuss the presentation and share links and make comments. We're also going to be using Mentimeter throughout this presentation today to give you the opportunity to share your thoughts and uh, share tips. And after the event, we'll share the responses from Mentimeter on the Enabling a Modern Curriculum blog. And we'll post the link for the blog in the chat later in the session. So let's give it Mentimeter a try now. Um, so you're ready for the first question. If you'd just like to scan the QR code on the screen or go to menti.com and type in the code, we've got a warm up question in Mentimeter waiting for you. You're also invited to share questions via Mentimeter throughout the presentation. And to do that, just click on the open Q&A button. And any questions we don't get to today will be used as inspiration for posts on our blog over the next couple of months. And you can like other people's questions to help with prioritising our blog posts. If you're tweeting throughout the session today, please use the OA Week hashtag, hash OA Week 2021. The Council of Australian University Librarians has four strategic programs and each program is led by a member of the board. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm the program director for the Enabling a Modern Curriculum program. And this program has three projects focused on open educational resources. And those projects are led by Tani Pierce, Marion Slauson and Adrian Stagg. And we were very keen to put together an event for OA Week that highlighted this other kind of open. Before we start, I'll introduce each of the facilitators for today's events. So we have Stephen Chang from La Trobe University and Adrian Stagg from the University of Southern Queensland, and they're both members of the Open Educational Resources Advocacy Project team. Tani Pierce is the project lead for the Open Educational Resources Collective Pilot Project, and Kate Davis is the core director of strategy and analytics. I'd also like to acknowledge the assistance of Nikki Anderson in preparing for today's events. And Nikki is part of the Open Educational Resources Professional Development Program project. And now I'm going to hand over to Stephen to get us started. Over to you, Stephen. Thanks, Fiona. So um, Open Educational Resources in five minutes. Um, OER aimed to solve three main problems. Next slide, please. Um, firstly, for learners and students, the cost of education and the cost of living has been rising sharply while student poverty is becoming commonplace, especially in more marginalised cohorts, which has massive implications for stu student equity. So if you're, you're a student and you're forced to choose between paying rent or buying a required textbook, that's pretty inequitable, and it means a big advantage is given to only those who can pay for it. A second problem faced by institutions and libraries in particular is that publishers are charging eye-watering prices for collections that increase every year. Meanwhile, library budgets are under the crunch. So both of these trends are pretty unsustainable. Next slide, please. The third problem we face is that of straight-jacketed straight learning resources. 
So a lot of learning and teaching is still pretty locked into traditional static uh, print centric models of, of learning resources. And this is partly because courses still assign expensive print textbooks because that's the way it's always been. But even where learning and resources have gone online, this hasn't always led to greater freedoms for academics and students. And this is uh, partly because of the straight jacketed nature of commercial licensing where resources are licensed for exclusivity and that artificial scarcity is used to textbooks as maximum priced commodities. So even though the radical possibilities of digital engagement are technically available, um, in practice, they're, they're actually foreclosed often by these models of commercial licensing and restrictive control. Um, COVID supercharged this move to online lear learning, but the question that's still faced by us is, have we gone from using straight-jacketed, inflexible print resources to straight-jacketed, inflexible online resources? Basically, have we gone from the frying pan into the fire? Um, but I think there are a ways around this dead end. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we are uh, opening up new avenues to tackle these problems and open education forms part of an open ecosystem that includes open research, open data, and they're all united in the fact that they're licensed expressly for maximum freedom rather than maximum exclusivity. And this freedom is gained through things like Creative Commons licenses, which tell users in a transparent way how they can freely use these resources up front while still safeguarding the rights and crediting um, creators and authors. There's a definition of oh, we are here. I won't read it out, but I want us to focus right in on the free use part. And it's not just free to read, there's a massive distinction. And this raises the question of what is free use? Uh, next slide, please, Kate. So free use through OER enables practices that we call the five R's featured here. And in a nutshell, what it means is you can keep these resources indefinitely. You can use them in different contexts for your purposes. You can change them to customize them for your course. You can curate different resources that complement each other and uh, remix them into a new resource. And last but not least, you can share them with anyone. So that's what's meant by free use. It's much more than free reading. Uh, next slide, please. So this process of free use, the five R's, um, enables a kind of triple freedom. Free as in free of cost for students, um, but also secondly, freedom for academics to design the curriculum around flexible customized resources tailored to suit their course. Thirdly, freedom for students to learn the way that they want, um, whenever they want, without barriers or restrictions. And through that, uh, strength, strengthening student autonomy and choice. And it's through these changes to learning and teaching itself that this starts to go beyond just open resources and into the territory of open educational practices. Uh, next slide, please, Kate. So these new open practices bring benefits for everyone. Um, we all save time by not reinventing the wheel. We make education accessible by lowering barriers. We stay current with a rapidly changing world by customizing content easily and quickly. Uh, we engage students in new and different ways. We enable lifelong learning by extending students access to learning materials indefinitely and you know beyond just their time at university into their life in workplaces and communities. Um, I could talk for hours about this, but I'm actually going to hand it back to Kate now to talk um, about some real life examples of these practices in action. Thanks very much, Stephen. So Stephen said we're going to take a look now at um, some examples. And what we've done is compile some case studies for you um, where academics have either adopted, adapted or created OERs or open textbooks. Um, to sh and we've uh, made these videos about them with the help to share about their experiences. Um, so our first case study is with Dr. Matthew Marquez and he is a psychology lecturer from La Trobe University. Um, and this case study focuses on adoption of an open text. Now, if everything's working smoothly, we will have a video.
I'm the coordinator for a second year uh, core subject in psychology, social psychology. And uh, this year uh, we decided to adopt uh, an open source textbook, open access resources from the NOBA project. So one of the main drivers for uh, selecting an open uh, resource for students was equity and access. Um, it's really important to me uh, to ensure that uh, students don't have any barriers to access their learning. So I guess one thing I've learned uh, through this whole experience is that, you know, there are various uh, open textbooks available and uh, like commercial textbooks, uh, you really have to do your homework and try to choose one that's best uh, for your needs and for your students' needs. That might not only be related to the content uh, for the students, but also instructor resources as well. My selection was on balance based around those factors in terms of meeting student needs and also balancing them against the teaching requirements and the standards that we would need to maintain. What we did this year uh, will change a little bit next year, um, but it, it certainly has not um, persuaded me to think about uh, moving away from open access textbooks now, uh, but rather sort of encouraged me to think of more creative and more, um, more accessible ways to engage uh, student learning. Preparation and planning is always a big part of any uh, running any subject or, or, or any course. Uh, in our particular subject, it wasn't the case, uh, even though we used uh, a NOVA project textbook around social psychology, it wasn't the case that every week that we wanted to lecture could be met by that particular textbook. So we also leveraged some other online resources and um, sources that we had available through Latrobe. It would have, you know, been more about being more prepared and, and planning ahead of time. Uh, but of course, these are all experiences that you take go, moving forward. And, you know, I, I would think that for me, at least, uh, the hardest step was making that first step. Uh, and from here, it's kind of tinkering around the edges and looking for new and innovative ways to uh, leverage accessible materials for students. Speaking personally, the barriers to adopting a new textbook um, relate to workload for the academic, really. And it, it will relate to maybe um, recreating materials, lectures, tutorials, um, you know, exams, assignments and so forth any change uh, will come at a cost uh, to somebody. My perspective is, you know, on balance, the cost to me over time, um, you know, doesn't outweigh the potential benefit to students. So there, there are certainly some barriers in terms of finding suitable uh, open text resources. Like I said, in my particular instance, we had to look at several different examples from the NOVA project to OpenStax to other sort of University of Michigan type open textbooks specific to social psychology to find some that were current, uh, that were detailed enough, uh, that covered the breadth of the content that we wanted. But we, we didn't find a perfect solution. So with us, we found a solution where we could customize within NOVA to create a compendium of sorts specific for that subject, still with some gaps that we would fill otherwise. On the second point, which relates to creation of new open textbooks, again, that might come down to time, motivation, effort, um, and uh, you know, to some extent, uh, recognition in workload for academics to be involved in such projects. I think that in my field, the people contributing to open access textbooks are often, you know, uh, leaders in their in their particular research field, uh, and they're writing, you know, an open access textbook chapter, usually, uh, you know, specific to their research, and so it's it's really. Um, knowledgeable, it's authoritative, it's considered as well, but some of these resources aren't necessarily updated and, and I'm not sure if there's an incentive for people to go and update when perhaps there's maybe no um, recognition, financial or, or institutional for, for the work that they're putting in. Big thanks to Matthew for sharing um, about his experience and um, also to Stephen who interviewed uh, Matthew for the video. Um, 
we've got a much extended version of this video that will pop up on the blog in the next couple of weeks. Um, and in that video, uh, Matthew also talks about how he's adopted open source software um, for statistics in his psychology units instead of using um, proprietary and expensive software and makes the point also that um, the open source software he uses is actually uh, easier for students to use than what they have been using. So Matthew spoke about how the team weren't able to identify a single textbook um, that met all of their needs uh, in terms of having both the content required and the depth of coverage um, that they wanted. Um, and I think that has the potential to be a barrier um, for academics because it's, it's not um, necessarily something that academics are used to, particularly in those dis disciplines that do teach to a textbook. So I've got a question for you all on Mentimeter now, which is um, around that barrier and what tips we could uh, give to academics to help them in dealing with that content, content gap. So while um, you're having a think about that and sharing your thoughts, I'm going to pose a question to Stephen, um, which is what options do uh, academics have in terms of curating resources together to form an open textbook, both in terms of tools, as well as uh, potential sources for content? So over to you, Stephen. Yeah, I think your options partly depend on how creative you want to get. So on one hand, you could adopt one particular resource and repurpose that to localize it or put a particular lens or viewpoint on it. And to use a musical analogy, that might be like remixing a song or something. Um, on the other hand, you could remix a variety of uh, broad different sources to create a, a, a mashup type of resource. And Musically, that's more analogous to mixing a few different songs to create a new Spotify playlist type of thing. Um, in terms of tools, my first thing would be talk to your colleagues. So your local librarian, your copyright advisors, educational designers, and your academic peers. And I think that peer-to-peer -peer guidance is especially important if it's your first time doing open educational practices. Um, a web tool I recommend is the Open Educational Licensing Toolkit, the OEL Toolkit, and that's a choose your own adventure tool that gives you uh, tailored guidance depending on how you're using an open resource or what you're doing, whether you're finding, using, modifying, making or sharing a resource, and it'll give you institution specific advice too. Um, in the video, Matt mentioned the NOBA project, and that's a really easy tool for remixing different peer review psychology open chapters. For it. So for anyone in that discipline, I really recommend the NOBA project. Um, in terms of content sources, uh, for textbooks specifically, I recommend the Open Textbook Library. It's got over 900 open textbooks. Um, most are reviewed by their peers and they're all licensed in a way that makes them modifiable and customizable. Um, beyond textbooks, I'd say look at Oasis, Openly Available Sources Integrated Search, and that's much broader and searches 114 different OER sources in one go. So if you're looking beyond textbooks and other types of learning resources, that's a good place to go. So together, I think these um, tools and content sources should give you a good basis to build your own open textbook, and if not, you can create your own. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so that, those were some really helpful tips, and uh, we'll leave this question open on Menti, um, so you can uh, keep contributing there while we move on to our next case study. So uh, our next case study is a case where a textbook was adapted. Uh, and this case study, um, I spoke to uh, Dr. Wendy Hargraves from the University of Southern Queensland, and again, if all the magic is happening, away we go. So the book that I've been involved in is called Academic Success, and it's a remixed publication based on Amy Baldwin's College Success. The book itself is designed for students to assist them with academic learning skills. So we found that there was a great need with first year experienced students to assist them with adapting to university and those skills. And this book became a source for students to be able to access this information. So our book is being used in courses across USQ. It's also moved well and truly beyond USQ. 
and uh, we've learnt that it's actually being used in 70 correctional centres um, across Australia for students who are incarcerated so that they can access the same sort of information that our other students can as well. When I began this process, I knew nothing about OERs. I'd had experience with writing and editing, but not with this whole new dimension. So I, I went from nothing, knowing nothing, to understanding what they are. Um, we were able to, and myself in particular, was able to get involved very, very quickly with what OERs are, how they work, what they mean. So there were practical skills in terms of are learning digital literacy in terms of understanding levels of permissions and copyright. And there also, there was that uh, philosophical understanding of, you know, we're creating something for a greater good um, to allow equity for students to access this information. So there was a lot of learning on my part. One thing I think we would do a little bit differently if we started this again would be collecting, being ready to collect data on the project right from the very start. We also need that data to support what we're doing and the, the effort that we're going to. And we weren't quite ready to collect that data from the moment of publication. So if I was doing this again, I would make sure that we understood those processes and had that ready to go right from the moment we published. Some of the barriers that I became aware of during this project was a general sense of fear that I had as an academic and as a writer of getting it wrong. The idea of really needing to understand copyright permissions, uh, that permission sense of we can work with someone else's words um, and we can use them if we attribute them in this particular way and then build on this knowledge. And so I had a sense of nervousness about that, um, but I was thrown straight in. So we had to sort of learn very fast how to overcome that. So that's a little bit of a barrier. Another one is this sort of tension between publishing as an academic and how well are these books regarded? Is this kind of publishing regarded? If, you know, if publishing is important for our tenure, then where does this fit? Where does this sit? Am I spending the very little time I have in the right kind of writing and publishing? I think there's a lot of work still to go there and a lot of evolution still happening there. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing where that goes, but that could be a barrier for the moment. The benefits we've seen from this project has, has really been in two areas. Firstly is for students. They have access to this amazing resource and they need this information and they want this information. But we also found that where we had benefits within the team. This experience was just fantastic for connecting with each other, collaborating, building something for the greater good. Um, I've also found the skills that I've learned from this project have given me sort of time saving devices. I can now draw on um, OERs to create other resources and build them faster and to a higher quality. So it's just been a fantastic thing to be involved in. An interesting thing about being involved in this project is discovering that it's a living thing, that it keeps growing and changing and evolving. So as to where we go next with this project, um, we've actually got a list already of ideas of, you know, let's try this, let's add more of this. Um, we've already um, heard information that another university is looking at adapting the text uh, for their purposes. So we, we're very keen to have a discussion with them about what they're going to do with it. So it's just exploded in a wonderful way. So thanks very much to Wendy for her time um, to record that video. Um, Wendy mentioned uh, that she had a bit of a concern about understanding conventions and rules around um, what you can and can't do when you're adapting open resources um, as a potential barrier for academics. And I think um, one of the things that really appeals to me about OERs is that um, the content doesn't necessarily have to be used in the same format. So in my last role, I did a lot of work on um, curriculum pedagogy projects, writing content or managing a team who was writing content um, for courses. And one of the real barriers is having text that you can adapt and turn into things like um, video scripts or um, uh, image uh, objects that kind of summarise content. Um, and so um, 
I wondered if you have any tips up your sleeve uh, for, for people about how they can um, overcome this barrier around um, knowing what they can and can't do in terms of adapting OER content. So um, I popped a mentee uh, question up on the screen for you to respond to. So we'd love for you to share your responses. Um, and I'm going to ask Adrian and Tani um, to share some thoughts on their experience with this as well. And uh, I should also apologise to Tani publicly for all the copyright inquiries I used to send her in the past uh, because I needed these tips as well. So, um, Adrian, do you want to uh, tell us a little bit about um, how academics can overcome this barrier? Well, I think in the, the main part, it's looking at what support services you already have around you. Uh, so, for example, um, a lot of universities will have a copyright officer. Um, you will have your librarians. If you don't know who that person is, reach out to somebody within the library that you do know and they will be able to connect you. Uh, I find that within the open education movement, uh, librarians tend to be the connectors of practice. So you can't go too far wrong by seeing your, your librarian. Um, I think as well, if you want to get really involved uh, in this, there are certainly professional development opportunities for you. Uh, so things like um, the OER certification that is offered by Creative Commons, or even the, um, the certification pro process that is offered by Spark in the United States. Uh, these are very formal processes, but the good thing is, uh, as we'll see with most open content, that the course content that they use in both of those certifications is free and open to access. So if you wanted to uh, something a little bit more structured, you could certainly uh, connect into those certification programs, download all the course content, and then take a look at it um, at your leisure. I'll pass over to Tani because she will certainly have other perspectives. You're Tani, presently you're muted, mute. Tani. Sorry. <laughs> I did it before too. <laughs> no. Oh, it looks like Tani's got a, a microphone connection issue. So we might um, skip over Tani and we can, uh, I think we've got another question for her later. Uh, no, we can't. We could for a moment. That's okay, Tani. We how's, might. Um, how's... Oh, you got now me? Got you. I'll be quick. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, basically, I, I feel I agree that there's, you know, there's set courses out there for us. But what we need as, you know, as central to, to pushing open access ahead is understanding where academics are coming from um, with these worries about barriers. So we have to build our capacity to have conversations with them and to understand where they're coming from. So the Open Education Network has a great approach where you get in the mindset of those academics. So you understand that there's a fear of, about how can I use this? This is not normally how I act in the academic world, reusing content. So, so by giving them the skills in copyright and open access licensing and getting them to understand the merit of the outputs, I think that's, that's really important. In addition to doing the courses, getting in that mindset as well. I think you're right, that is really important. And um, the team I worked with in the past on this was half librarians and half kind of learning designers. And it was a great mix in terms mm. of being able to share insights. Awesome, thanks very much, Tani. Okay, so we have another case study. And this time uh, our case study uh, features uh, Dr. Govind Krishnamurthy from uh, the University of Southern Queensland again. And he co-authored an open textbook called Trauma-Informed Behaviour Support, a practical guide to developing resilient learners. And I have to confess, I've passed this book on to a couple of teacher friends after um, working on editing um, this case study this week. Um, so this uh, book is published on USQ's open textbook platform, um, and it includes multimedia and quizzes to support student learning. So here we go. So this is our very first venture into doing open textbooks. Um, so the op open textbook is the uh, prescribed text for a course within the um, School of Education. I think it's an innovative course, trauma-informed practice is really an emerging area. 
um, and the text will form part of some of the new micro-credentialing programs that we're hoping to offer within the School of Psychology and Counseling, which is really great. One obviously is about reach, uh, I mean, the program is all about helping vulnerable students. Um, so I think from a social justice point of view, it fits quite nicely that it's free, that it's accessible, um, that we've included, um, we have the options of including like multimedia content because it's like an ebook. I think from when we're talking about, um, you know, trying to kind of uh, have a sense of reaching kind of at risk and vulnerable communities and, and the schools that work with them are not necessarily well resourced either. So I, I like that we can give them something in return for their service. It's just a nice introduction to them about the work that we do that can then maybe form the basis of other partnerships in the future. So we've had people reach out and, you know, ask, um, you know, just let us know about how they found it and things like that, which is also really reassuring. So you form relationships that you never thought you would, <laughs> um, which is nice. Kay and I have built our whole research and service profile <laughs> around the program and the book. We've been able to make a lot of relationships and build kind of research programs from it. So it's been really useful. I think for anyone listening, I think you need the same level of rigor and um, scrutiny <laughs> that you need with any sort of text. Um, I think I've learned that it's a multi-year project. Um, even if you have all the content there, um, I think it's taught me that you really need a team of people who are really, um, yeah, who are there to kind of support you with the nuts and bolts of it, because it's really hard to do as an academic to fit all the rest of it in. Um, it's taught me that it can really complement your teaching, your service, your research, um, you know, as someone who's within uh, academia. And it's a really neat way to send, to make ideas viral, I think, you know, like I think you can get the word out really quickly about things. You know, I think the idea of the open text allows for kind of collaborations from kind of with, you know, where you are, but kind of around the world as well. And I think we would try and do a little more of that and have it as a way to kind of bring together people as well. But I think the thing that I would still do is to be able to always document the work we're doing, um, any innovative sort of work we're doing, because that's essentially what formed the book is that we were able to develop course material slides that we then worked up into a book form. Uh, my advice is do it, you know, to have a team around you. So uh, to have a couple of people working on it, I think would be good. If you're, if you're an academic and thinking about this, I think this year we've involved a couple of students. So we've kind of co-produced some of the content. Um, I think really thinking about um, finding synergies in the work you're already doing and thinking about how you can convert that to, you know, a, you know, textbook form, how it's going to actually help you with your teaching and research and things like that. I think really like actively schedule in time and think of it as quite a large project. All right, thanks to Govind and also to Nikki Anderson who interviewed him for this video. Um, so that's two academics now that have really um, emphasised uh, the benefits of open textbooks from an equity perspective. Actually, I think all three have. Um, and that's certainly enough of a reason to pursue openness uh, in its own right. But what I found really interesting in that last case study was the other benefits that were cited included, including giving back to um, practitioners um, and the ability to make your ideas go viral. Um, the idea of relationship building through other people using uh, the text and creating opportunities for research collaboration. And I think, um, you know, these are all benefits that I'm sure would appeal to uh, many academics. Um, but there are barriers. And one of the pieces of advice that Govind gave um, uh, to other academics was to think about uh, an open textbook uh, development as a big project. 
Um, and I think a sense of not knowing where to start or how to manage an open textbook project might be a bit of a barrier for some academics. One of the things I edited out of that first video for length was um, a few references to uh, being grateful for the support um, that was given by the library for that particular project. So um, I wonder, Tan, if you might just uh, tell us a little bit about um, the barriers around managing an open textbook project and some of the things uh, your library might do to uh, address that. Um, and while she's doing that, I would love for everyone to share uh, tips that they might give to authors around managing the book publishing process. Thanks, Kate. Um, I think one of the most important things for us is to, as with any good project, to have that top level support. So we've got really great support at USQ from our um, DVC academic, our Director of Library Services, and that's actually translated into dedicated roles. So we've got a Manager of Open Educational Practice, Adrian Stagg, and an Open Content Librarian, Nikki Anderson. So. <laughs> Underpinning that is making open everyone's business. And that's Adrian's catchphrase at USQ where we've actually uh, given staff and developed them in a way that they can, you know, a, a liaison librarian can have a conversation about open access with academics. So there's a mindset already. And then we actually get into the actual textbook production or the open educational resource production. Um, underpinning our approach is understanding again, as I said before, the drivers for academics when they actually are taking on these projects. Um, we had a professor talk yesterday, Associate Professor Eric Fine in another session, and he said there's got to be extrinsic and extrinsic uh, rewards. And he feels that they are aligned at USQ in producing open textbooks. So our project management is underpinned by that. Uh, and it, I guess it, it translates into um, a team of people who can support. Um, so I think um, Govan just said, you know, we need support with the nuts and bolts, and that's come um, up through research as well that, you know, I want to do it, but I don't have a lot of time. So how am I actually going to make mm. this work? And I don't understand the process. Uh, so at USQ, we've got things like a, gra a OEP grants program since 2015, um, where we've constructed an environment to support uh, grant recipients in producing open educational resources. Uh, and there's a community of practice where there's peer support um, with that group and they, they as a team, um, share problems and solve problems. Uh, so supporting that is, is project management. So, and Govan's right, it can be a multi-year project and Nikki and Adrian and others who are involved are nodding, I'm sure. <laughs> so we actually have to actively schedule time into support and the academic has to take that on as well. So underpinning project management are things like um, memorandums of understanding um, between participants so they know what they're in for and a really frank discussion, frank discussions about, you know, what's involved in these projects, scoping the project because these things can, you know, the, the scope can creep. Uh, increasing copyright and licensing awareness, you know, and going through a, a workflow to produce um, the, the open educational resource. So things like quality peer review um, processes and awareness and an awareness of, you know, the workflow and what, what's, what's uh, expected on both ends from the author and also from the support staff. But we are at all times very aware that um, academics are the experts in the field. They're the, you know, they're, they're they're producing the content. We're working with them, but we're supporting them in that de deliverable. Do you have any questions for me, Kate? No, I think we'll leave it there. There's some really great tips on the screen. So I'm, I'm glad we're getting these to uh, capture on the blog as well. Thanks Excellent. very much, Tani. Um, so our last case study is uh, a little bit different. It's not about so much about adoption or adapting or um, or creating an open textbook. Um, it's more focused on uh, OERs rather than open text, um, which is of course a specific type of OER, um, but it's about how the underpinning philosophy of open educational practice um, and the underpinning philosophy, philosophy of openness in OERs aligns with indigenous knowledge practices. So uh, Dr. Joanna Funk is an academic at Charles Darwin University uh, who uses OERs created um, by and with Indigenous creators in her teaching practice. And um, she uses them as objects to learn about the discipline, but also as a way of encouraging students to develop their understanding of um, Indigenous knowledge practices and how they intersect with uh, openness.
Um, so we worked on a series of, of projects for, for local government with Aboriginal corporations, with Fisheries Research Development Corporation and biosecurity organizations um, to develop four sets of uh, online open resources that are open a certain kind of way. Now, the interesting thing about that was that a lot of these resources were offered and uh, the licenses chosen by the Indigenous Knowledge Authorities I was working with. While having conversations with some of the authors, these people were developing an oyster farm and aquaculture uh, businesses. Uh, we were developing resources and videos for them to use to prove that they had met certain criteria for the certificates uh, in aquaculture, for example. However, they were using it in their own language and choosing their own licenses. And when I got to the licensing part of things, this is where it got really interesting because my definition and the Western kind of centric open access definition is all about technical access and adaptable resources to be repurposed. And these were considered to be quasi contemporary resources. It wasn't like there was wholly traditional knowledge being represented. It was, you know, how to, how to string a long line in the water and how to measure oysters growth and these types of things. But the fact that it was being authored by Indigenous people meant that there was this very interesting um, overlap between access and openness that they had uh, a lot to do with the consensus over. So open was in terms of they were it, the resources were open to their authorship and their uh, authority um, and agency over who could repurpose their intellectual work. Well, they haven't been adapted because the uh, the licenses that they chose were were not like don't don't adapt these resources, but you can use them. And so I've used a lot of these resources in my teaching and inspired students to see um, indigenous knowledge communities and work um, on country in a, in a very different way than what the, the dominant media narrative is. Um, it's also enriched pre-service teachers and social workers and um, a lot of students from lots of different disciplines are here at CDU. It's enriched their, their understanding of what access means. Um, and it's not just a, a technical view of, of access, but it's an ontological uh, principle about who gets to author knowledge and who has the authority over, over knowledge. As the Western view of openness kind of conflicts with that. We have access to everything. Whereas with traditional knowledge and uh, with knowledge that comes from certain communities, um, you need to understand that there's a lot more nuance and complexity based on lots of things that we just don't exist in Western uh, knowledge systems. Thanks to Joanna for her very thoughtful interview. Um, an extended version of that will also be on the blog and I'd really encourage you to watch it. It delves into Joanna's um, research uh, around uh, Indigenous knowledge and intersection with openness. So I think uh, it, it'll be a, a great resource for you. So Joanna's interview reveals um, some of the complexities around working with Indigenous knowledge in open educational resources in terms of um, different understanding, understandings of openness. Um, if you missed the panel discussion yesterday around uh, Indigenous knowledge and openness, um, I would definitely encourage you to uh, follow up on the recording of that. Um, I think it kind of it touched on many of the things um, that Joanna raises uh, as well, uh, just related to research rather than explicitly OERs. Um, so one of the great benefits of OERs is that they allow for Indigenous perspectives and voices to be brought into the curriculum and into the resources we use to support the curriculum. Um, but a lack of understanding of, of different approaches to knowledge management across cultures could be a stumbling block. So I'd like to pose another question to you all now, and um, particularly to any Indigenous uh, colleagues who are in the session today. What advice would you have for authors or um, perhaps editors of uh, open texts who want to ensure that Indigenous voices are represented in the open textbooks um, that they're working on? 
Um, and while we're waiting for you to uh, share your thoughts, um, I've asked Adrian if he could suggest some resources. Uh, and he's going to talk you through some resources and exemplars. Um, and we'll be sharing those links in the chat. So over to you, Adrian. Thanks very much, Kate. Uh, one of the things that I, I wanted to touch on um, was some of the uh, comments that we've had so far around advice. And uh, what's really good is that the resources that I'm about to suggest do touch on where people are thinking at the moment anyway. The first one that I would suggest is the Open Textbook Library. And Stephen um, noted that one in his responses earlier. The reason why I would suggest that people look at the Open Textbook Library is that you've got over 900 different textbooks in the library to look over and to see whether or not something is a close fit. Now, the joy with, with OER is that you're able to um, adapt and adopt material and remix it in most cases. So look at the Open Textbook Library, check out the items that are available in your discipline, and then maybe consider how you might want to use those rather than necessarily going to the work of authoring something yourself from scratch. And I think that's something that we've heard is has massive workload implications. The second one that I would point you to, if you do go down the route of wanting to author whether a chapter uh, to add to an existing textbook or whether or not you're trying you're going to author an entire textbook is the BC campuses self-publishing guide. This is a really practical resource that will walk you through the considerations of uh, going down this, this path of authoring an open text. The other one is uh, produced, um, uh, it's produced through the Rebus community is authoring open textbooks. This is, um, again, this is an open textbook on authoring open textbooks. So it doesn't get much more meta than that. And this is great because within the uh, guide um, to authoring open textbooks, you have things like checklists, uh, considerations at all points. So it is a really good staged approach. Now, we have heard as well some of the lecturers, uh, Govind in particular, mentioned about involving students in this process. And I think that this is a really great way of introducing authentic assessment into your course and getting students to work with openly licensed content. So there is a fantastic resource, which is called a guide to making open textbooks with students. And if you are involved in the open movement in any way, or you've read um, the, the research, a lot of the names on that textbook will really stand out. They are really luminaries in this field. And uh, one of the best things um, that we have adapted at USQ out of the guide for making open textbooks with students is the memorandum of understanding that are in the back. There's a whole bunch of templates that you can use. And lastly, I noticed on the last Menti question, a couple of people had said about conceptualizing what a textbook actually is and that open is an opportunity to reconsider what it is that an open textbook offers. What is a textbook anyway? And uh, I, I really uh, encourage you to take a look at the Fundamentals of Anatomy and Physiology uh, book, which is, uh, the link is just appearing in the chat now. This includes um, some H5P activities. These are embedded quizzes so that as a student progresses their way through the book, uh, they can actually interact with some self-assessment quizzes so that they can test their own understanding. And the last point that I'll leave you about the H5P activities is that if you are running a, um, a if you are running a Pressbooks instance, there is now an API which will plug your uh, learning activities in your textbook straight through to gradebook. So if you actually want to embed accessible activities within um, your Pressbooks open text, there is a way of doing that seamlessly. Uh, so I'll leave you with those five resources to consider for today. Great, thanks Adrian. So lots of practical material there um, that uh, you can take as you uh, think about how you might um, work with Indigenous communities to bring Indigenous voices into your open textbooks. And I think there are um, some points on the screen that are really critical and that is, you know, that this is about collaborating um, and working with uh, Indigenous people. Um, and making sure you've got appropriate permissions in place, understanding cultural IP and how that fits 
uh, as well. So I think uh, if you take those really practical resources that Adrian shared and then um, that's great. And then it's really about um, taking that, uh, taking the time to engage um, with the community uh, who you'd like to be involved in your book project. So um, what we'd like to do now is uh, just share with you a, a couple of things that we've been working on this year and we'll continue to work on for the next, um, I think in one case, even uh, two years. Um, so we've talked a lot about what OERs are today and what some of the benefits and barriers um, uh, are related to them. Um, but we wanted to tell you a little bit about some practical strategies that we've been uh, putting in place through projects to uh, kind of overcome some of those barriers to adoption of OERs and to push the OER agenda forward um, at a national level. Um, so uh, Tani, Adrian and Marion Slauson are each um, run, uh, leading projects uh, for call in the space at the moment. Um, Marion can't be with us today. She is suffering from the power outage um, in Victoria after the storms last night. Stephen's also having power um, outage issues. Um, but uh, so Fiona will speak for Marion. Um, but first of all, Tani, can I get you to tell us a little bit about the OER Collective? Thanks, Kate. Uh, the OER Collective has come out of, well, it's part of the Enabling a Modern Curriculum Program, which has already been mentioned, uh, because we see um, if we can work together, we can, as university libraries, we're in a really good place to partner with academics and community uh, to create some really innovative OER outcomes um, in teaching and learning. Um, so basically, we've got two aims. Uh, the first one is to facilitate collaborative authoring and publishing of open textbooks in targeted priority disciplines. And there's a preference for in, including local and um, Indigenous content. Uh, we also, secondly, uh, want to allow member institutions to publish their own textbooks in disciplines of their choosing. And because we recognise, and those two aims are there, um, because we recognise that core member institutions are at various stages in their development in terms of exploring open textbooks. And the dual aims uh, will actually allow member institutions with different goals and different needs to benefit from the collective. It could be a first attempt at open access publishing or actually participating in a collaborative publishing effort. We'll draw on the strength of the networks um, within the core membership, and we're already doing that in the project teams, uh, to encourage cross-institutional collaboration on open textbooks. And we also want to facilitate knowledge sharing and community building. So we really look forward to um, sending out the call for expressions of interest later in the year, and I encourage you to be involved in the collective. Thanks, Tani. Uh, this is a really ambitious project and the team have done an amazing amount of work in the last few months uh, and we're currently uh, socialising a model uh, of membership for the collective um, and really looking forward to taking that to the board in the next couple of weeks. So that's the OER Collective. We have uh, another OER project uh, and this one is being led by Adrian. So Adrian, I'll let you give us an introduction. Thanks very much, Kate. Uh, so the OER advocacy project really dovetails with Call's mission that we are, we transform how people experience knowledge. It's going to recognise that if you want to really invest in a modern curriculum, you need to incorporate open education because it really is predicated on discovery, use, sharing, remix, repurposing information, and uh, viewing our students more as uh, as digital citizens um, in a much broader context. So the OER advocacy project comprises two work packages for delivering in 2022. The first is a suite of advocacy resources, contextual for the higher education uh, environment, which will be produced specifically for librarians. Uh, you'll be able to access these resources individually, but we are also building a number of case study scenarios which help to further contextualize and situate those resources. The second package is a stakeholder analysis that informs our high level advocacy initiatives at the institutional and the national level. Uh, Australia, 
unlike the US and Canada, don't have accompanying legislation or even federal funding for open education. And we're looking to create a platform for coordinated advocacy. So I would recommend that you keep looking at the blog, which we've linked to a number of times during today's session. There will be some future announcements and there will also be calls for feedback and testing rounds in 2022. So our team is looking uh, forward to uh, meeting with other practitioners and advocates uh, who can uh, add value to this project as we move forward. Thanks very much, Kate. Thanks, Adrian. So I think one of the, um, the great things about this project is that we did a survey a little while ago uh, and had a lot of responses um, from the sector, uh, close to, I think it was about 170 responses, and one of the PD needs around um, open educational practice that came through really strongly is uh, the ability to advocate to academics, so this is very exciting. Um, and since Fiona is standing in for Marion to introduce um, the next project, I am going to just hand over to you for the for the finish, Fiona, now. Um, and uh, I will just say we, we didn't have time for questions. We thought we might be tight, um, but we wanted to make this an interactive um, session. So please do um, pop your questions in on Mentimeter. If you have any, we will um, take them and uh, see if we can come up with blog posts. Uh, if you popped a question in the chat during the session, we'd love it if you took it over to Mentimeter where we'll have a record of it. Um, and with that, I will hand over to Fiona to talk about PD. Thanks very much, Kate. And I think the OERD PD project, which Marion is leading, <clears throat> is really, um, really so important because it's going to support um, the building of capability around OEA use and understanding in academic libraries. And we've seen today how momentum, I think, is really building around OER and we need to make sure we've got that capacity and capability in um, libraries. So the project team is developing a proposal for an OER PD program, which will be delivered in 2022. And the proposal is informed by findings from an environmental scan, literature review and stakeholder survey, which is um, what the project team have been working on. The other thing about the program is that it will recognise differing levels of OER experience um, and will address the needs of experienced and novice, novice practitioners in libraries. The aim is um, to increase capacity for academic libraries to provide leadership in OER practice within their institutions so we can really um, drive the um, OER agenda at a national level and there'll be lots more news about this in 2022. So we have reached the end of our session today and I'd really like to um, thank everybody who's been involved particularly like to start I'd like to thank our case study interviewees Dr Matthew Marks, Dr Wendy Hargraves, Dr Govin Christian Morphy and Dr Joanna Funk and also thank Nikki Anderson for her assistance with the case studies. I'd also like to thank the Open Access Week organising committee led by Thomas Chafee, with particular thanks to Sally Murray Walsh, Sandra Fry and Ginny Barber. Thank you to everyone here as well. Thank you for generously sharing your ideas in Mentimeter. And as Kate said, we'll share those responses on the blog. And I'll say again, you've heard a lot about the blog today, but I'll say again, don't forget, you can follow along with the progress of our projects on the blog. So if you'd like to scan the QR code on the screen, you can access the, the blog. And we've also put the link in the chat. So please subscribe to the blog. Finally, um, just as we're finishing, I'd like to say there's still time to register for the final event in Open Access Australia's Open Access Week program. And that event is making research truly accessible. And that's on this afternoon. And the link is also in the chat. So thank you everyone for coming. I hope you're feeling very inspired about OER and um, we look forward to updating you about these projects on the Enabling a Modern Curriculum blog. Thank you.